although that might have to be Fiona MacLeod who will uh, take up that uh, meeting for Bill Kidd. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. Officer, can I take this opportunity to wish you and the whole chamber a Merry Christmas and a very happy and prosperous New Year. Can I ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Uh, can I take the opportunity to congratulate Kezia Dugdale on her election as Deputy Leader of Scottish Labour. Uh, warmly welcome her to her place today and wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. On a more sombre note, Presiding Officer, at the end of a week uh, in which we have witnessed horrific acts of terror around the world, can I take the opportunity, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, to send condolences to the people of Australia and of course to the people of Pakistan. Our thoughts are very much with them at this time. Later today I will have meetings to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Can I associate myself with the First Minister's remarks and I think the whole Chamber would share those and our condolences go to the people of Pakistan and all those with family here in Scotland who are feeling the pain at this time. President officer, there is a crisis in the oil industry. The unions say so, the companies say so, the Wood Group, Shell, BP, Petrofac are all cutting wages. A thousand jobs have gone and thousands more are on the line. What is the Scottish Government going to do? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, thank Kezia Dugdale for raising an issue that is very important and an issue that is of great concern to those who work in our oil and gas industry. Uh, let me answer the question briefly in two parts. Firstly, uh, the Scottish Government, in terms of our responsibilities, will continue to do what we are doing to support innovation, for example, through our £10 million of funding uh, for the Oil and Gas Innovation Centre. We will continue to support skills in the industry. We've invested an additional £6.5 million pounds, uh, to support skills. And, of course, we have published the Energy Skills Investment Plan, and we will look to refresh that and make sure that that is fit for purpose, as we also continue to ring-fence 500 modern apprenticeships for the energy sector in each year of the current Parliament. But the second... Uh, part of my answer, uh, Presiding Officer, and I hope we can strike some unity in this chamber today, is to uh, support the industry in their calls to the UK Government uh, for more action. Uh, and I would highlight three things. Firstly, bolder action on reducing the supplementary charge. Uh, secondly, urgent action on the proposed new investment allowance. And thirdly, uh, support for exploration. That's what the industry wants, and I hope we can all get behind yeah, yeah. it. President officer, the First Minister will have Labour support when she goes to the UK Government with her calls, but she must be reminded by the fact that she has at least six responsibilities to the oil and gas industry here in Scotland. She mentioned skills and innovation, but she also has responsibility for onshore business taxes, support to find new markets, supporting infrastructure and indeed diversifying the industry. So the same old answers about looking to Westminster for solutions just do not stack up. This is one of Scotland's key industries and yesterday Jake Malloy of the RMT said we are on the brink of meltdown. Robin Allen of Premier Oil said that the North Sea oil industry is close to collapse. Of course the UK Government should respond and quickly, but the Scottish Government has to work with unions and the industry to find ways to maintain employment levels right now. What assurances can the First Minister give oil workers and their families that their jobs, 300,000 jobs across Scotland and across the UK, are reliant on this? What security do they have this Christmas from this government? First Minister. I, I, I hope the, the words we've been hearing from Kezia Dugdale and her colleagues in recent days about a new consensual approach can survive beyond the First, first Minister's questions. Uh, because I've, I've, I've said, I think I've said in every FMQ session, I am, keen to work, I am keen to work across party boundaries. And Kezia Dugdale is correct. This is an important issue. Uh, she's asked me specifically about actions we will take. I've given her some of the specifics and we will continue to support the industry in every way we can. I will be meeting Malcolm Webb of Oil & Gas UK on the 14th of January. Uh, some of what I called on the UK government to do, though, was not 
the Scottish Government or the SNP simply calling on the UK Government to do. I was quoting some of the things in a letter to me from Oil and Gas UK. And I should also say uh, that Oil and Gas uh, UK talks in that uh, same letter about their good relationship with ministers in the Scottish Government. That good relationship and that uh, determination to support the industry will continue very strongly uh, in my time as First Minister. And again, in the interests of the consensus approach that I am genuinely keen to build, if there are specific proposals that any other party wants to bring forward, then do so, but make them specific so that we can give them the serious consideration we would want to. President Officer, the First Minister mentions Oil and Gas UK, and Oil and Gas UK told her that production was falling, and they told her that prices were falling too, yet she persisted with her predictions around oil prices. <laughs> and this week, this week, President Officer, Order. this week, oil dropped it below $60 a barrel. And in today's papers, John Swinney says it will be back up to $110 a barrel by next year. Whilst Professor Ronald MacDonald says a fall to $40 is not unreasonable. Imagine that the world leading economist Ronald MacDonald, just imagine for a second that a world leading economist knows more about this than John Swinney does. That would be catastrophic for the North Sea oil industry. Mr Swinney. So, <laughs> so, President, let's look to Mr. the future. Steele. Has the Scottish Government done an assessment of the long term impact of a falling oil price and will they publish it? First Minister. We will, we will continue. We will continue to work with the industry, doing the work that's required to support them. You know, there is, there is Order, not, Ms. Mara. There, there is not a week goes by, probably, that Fergus Ewing is not meeting with companies active in the North Sea oil and gas sector. Perhaps, perhaps fairly early in her tenure as Deputy Leader of Scottish Labour, Kezia Dugdale will also take some time to meet with those companies. I'm glad to hear it. And then we can try to build some consensus around the things they want us to do. Now, just in terms of uh, John Swinney and our comments about oil experts, can I point out to Kezia Dugdale that the $110 a barrel, it's OPEC in their recently published World Oil Outlook that projects a nominal uh, price of $110 until the year 2020. So, you know, that is where that prediction comes from. But can I... Can I also just repeat Order. this point? We can have, and I am pretty sure we will have in the weeks, months, perhaps years to come, uh, vigorous political debates about this and other issues across this chamber. But Kezia Dugdale, I thought, started in the right tone today when she put the focus... When she put... Order! When she put the focus rightly on jobs and on the future of an important industry. Now, I want to work with that industry and with others across this chamber if they are willing to support the industry. And I invite others to be part of that effort. President officer, this is the First Minister who is so in touch with the oil industry. She was in Shetland four months ago promising a second oil boom. Four days ago, her energy minister... Four days ago, her energy minister was in Aberdeen, rightly pleading with oil companies not to pay their workers off this Christmas. I was in Aberdeen two weeks ago talking to the Oil and Training Gas Academy, and they are desperate for support from this government to invest in skills, to make sure that if the oil price rises again, they still have the people to make the most from that. Isn't it the truth that the Scottish government just didn't see this crisis coming? because they believe their own wishful thinking about oil prices. Surely we cannot have a First Minister so unprepared, so unsighted on such a key industry. Will she initiate an inquiry into why her government was so wrong in the past so that we can get this right in the future?
First Minister, there are tens of thousands of Order. jobs. You need to be able to tell the Scottish public why you got it so wrong in the past so that you can get it right in the future. Do you not? First Minister. I think it was at least two years ago that we re-established the Energy Skills Academy. So determined were we to support skills in the sector. I, in, I think my first answer to Kezia Dugdale outlined the support that we are giving to skills development in the sector. The industry will get the support they need from the Scottish Government uh, for skills development, as they will do for innovation. But let me come back to what I think is the central issue here and you know I'll keep trying to find this note of consensus the sector the industry wants us to unite to call on the UK government to accelerate action around the new investment allowance they want us to unite to call on the UK government to increase support for exploration and I think we should call on the UK government to take more action around reducing the supplementary charge. We heard a couple of weeks ago uh, Danny Alexander talk about reducing it from 32% to 30 which is welcome. What he didn't quite uh, talk so much about was the fact that he increased it from 20% to 32% in the first place. So let us come together to call for the sensible action that those in the industry want. I think those whose jobs are uh, under threat right now will look at us and want to see us coming together in that way, not having a party political ding-dong. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I add the thoughts and prayers of myself and my party to those who have been affected by the horrific events in Australia and Pakistan? I know that there are those who are affected in Scotland too, and they are in all of our thoughts. Uh, can I also uh, welcome Labour's new deputy leader on her election uh, and ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland? Uh, no plans in the immediate future. Ms Davidson. Prating Officer, when he unveiled his plans to reform stamp duty on house buying in October, John Swinney said he didn't intend to take more money from people than was currently collected. His exact words were, I have decided that the taxes raised should be revenue neutral raising no more or less than the taxes they replace. Since then, stamp duty rates have been cut across the UK by 800 million and by 80 million in Scotland. People buying houses now are getting a better deal. Yet the SNP's position is to take that deal away. It is, in fact, an £80 million tax grab on Scotland's homeowners. Order. Two months ago, the SNP government said quite clearly that property taxes should raise no more or less than the taxes that they replace. Has the First Minister changed her mind? Can I firstly say I've looked at the proposals that Ruth Davidson and her party have put forward today and I, I think a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this issue, invited her to bring forward proposals and I said I would consider them carefully. So uh, I will keep that promise and I will consider those proposals with the Deputy First Minister very carefully. Um, I noticed that in uh, the press release around these proposals, uh, Ruth Davidson said they would cost £90 million and that they are affordable uh, because uh, of a benefit to the Scottish Government budget. I'm not quite clear how she can yet arrive at that conclusion because we haven't got to a final agreement on the block grant adjustment and the direction of travel that we think we're headed in wouldn't take us anywhere near £90 million. Uh, when we get uh, the final, and I stress final, agreement on block grant adjustment, we will then be able to assess whether our proposals are revenue neutral, revenue positive or revenue negative. And at that point, we will be able to consider uh, further proposals uh, of our own if we want to bring any forward and uh, consider further proposals of the Conservative Party. So that's the spirit in which I uh, approach this issue. It is in the spirit of the consensus I have offered. And to be fair to Ruth Davidson, she's brought forward specific proposals and they will get serious consideration by this government. Ms Davidson. Well, I absolutely welcome the First Minister's conversion to the cause. I'm glad she's going to consider our proposals. And let me press my case, because there are some simple facts here. From midnight on the 3rd of December, thanks to the UK government, homeowners in Scotland are paying £80 million less in tax. The, the proposals published this morning by the Scottish government are fully costed, not just from, sorry, by the Scottish Conservatives, correct, 
which I, I hope the Scottish Government will soon adopt, given she's so consensual on it. They are fully costed, not just from the £80 million tax cut that will be passed on, but also from all of the other unallocated Barnet consequentials from the 2014 autumn statement. The proposals that we have put forward, and I'm glad that the First Minister is going to consider them, gives a tax cut for ordinary people wanting to get on the ta property ladder, a tax cut for ordinary people wanting to climb the property ladder, and at the lower end, it will take more people out of tax altogether. And compared to the published SNP plans, they constitute a better deal for every single home buyer. First Minister, again, this week, the same as last week, the week before, the week before that, claims she wants to be consensual. So far, she's not actually moved on any issue. We've shown how it can be done. So please work with me to make sure it is done and we give home buyers an early Christmas present. When can we meet to make these proposals become a reality? First Minister. Uh, can I just say firstly, uh, presiding officer, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, my approach to consensus does not extend as far as to allow the Scottish Conservatives to call themselves the Scottish Government. I have to draw a line <laughs> in the sand. Uh, I know Ruth Davidson likes lines in the sand, so I'm going to draw one quite firmly <laughs> there. Um, the Finance Secretary uh, has already offered to meet with Gavin Brown to discuss this, and that offer of a meeting is still there. Let me just make two, two points briefly. Uh, it's worth reminding the Chamber that under our proposals, compared to the UK Government proposals, 80% of transactions would uh, leave people better off uh, or no worse off, and 5,000 more people would be lifted out of tax altogether and pay nothing. Now, I've said I'll consider the Conservative proposals, but let me tell her one aspect of them that I want to consider very carefully. Because under the proposal she's put forward today, the 80% of people who buy houses under £250,000 would be £100 better off than they would be under our proposal. But the 2% of people who buy houses over £500,000 would be £12,600 better off. So one of the things I want to consider is simply, is that fair? Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the if First Minister will uh, let us know uh, what she thinks of the Supreme Court judgment in relation to the two midwives on participation in abortion and where that leaves individual workers' rights and relate to conscientious objection. First Minister. Uh, well, the ruling yesterday confirms that midwives' right to conscientious objection from taking part in abortions remains protected. Lady Hale clarified in her opinion that midwives could not be compelled to participate in, and I quote, actually performing the tasks involved in the course of treatment. Yeah. Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Is the First Minister aware that a number of Scottish businesses, including in my own constituency, have difficulty trading with Cuba due to the US blockade? And will she therefore join me in welcoming President Obama's historic statement yesterday announcing moves to normalise diplomatic and economic ties with Cuba, which included the immediate release of the remaining three members of the so-called Miami Five? First Minister. Um, yes, I, I do. I do very much welcome uh, the announcement from President Obama yesterday about uh, normalising relations between the United States and Cuba. Uh, and I would go further and say that if that assists Scottish businesses in increasing their exports, then that is very much to be welcomed. Question three, Will Rennie. Uh, can I associate myself with the remarks about the suffering in Pakistan and Australia and also welcome Kezia Dugdale uh, to her position? to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will Rennie. Yesterday we learned from the Public Audit Committee that the person appointed by Ministers to head up Revenue Scotland has no accounting or taxation qualifications. Was this really a wise appointment? First Minister. Uh, the Director General of Finance in the Scottish Government is a chartered accountant. So that's the first part of... Uh, my answer to Willie Rennie. Can I say, in addition to that, though, I, I read some comments uh, issued by Willie Rennie at the weekend criticising the head of Revenue Scotland, who in that context wasn't able to answer back. But yesterday, when she was before the committee and would have been able 
to answer directly the points that Willie Rennie wanted to put to her. He didn't bother turning up to the committee to put those points directly to her. I have to say, I think in the relationship between politicians and civil servants, that was rather a poor show. When, when she was asked question by Tavish Scott yesterday in the Public Audit Committee, she soundly failed to answer any question at all. And yesterday, yesterday, Caroline Gardner stood by her report. She said that there was absolutely clear evidence. I'm surprised that the First Minister continues to stand by this position. Ministers boasted. They boasted that this would be the most efficient tax agency in the world. But it's already 25% over budget. We have the prospect of an old-fashioned paper-based system in the 21st century. And now we discover the head of the tax agency has no tax qualification. It's hard to believe that just three weeks ago, the head of Revenue Scotland said there was nothing negative to report. What confidence, what confidence can we have that the First Minister will tell us if anything negative happens again. First Minister. You know, just let me repeat, Willie Rennie uh, accused the civil servant at the weekend of potentially misleading Parliament and then didn't have the courtesy to go to the committee to put that allegation to her directly and allow her the opportunity to answer. But can I say more substantively on this issue? Uh, I did not and do not criticise the report of Audit Scotland. What I gave in answer to Willie Rennie last week was some substantial facts about the progress that Revenue Scotland is making on the employment of yeah. staff, on the implementation of its IT system, on the testing of those IT systems. And I think all of us should be supporting and getting behind uh, the Revenue Scotland as they make the progress they need to make to implement and deliver the devolved taxes from the 1st of April. The Deputy First Minister and I will be overseeing this very closely. Uh, the member or any member uh, is entitled, as they have done in the past, to ask the officials to go before parliamentary committees. Maybe in future Willie Rennie will turn up to one and ask some questions himself. So this is a, this is a, a matter of the utmost seriousness. And I said to him in perfectly good faith last week, and I say to him in perfectly good faith again today, that this government takes it seriously, and I'm happy to discuss it in this chamber or anywhere else with Willie Rennie at any time. Question four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on a judicial inquiry being held regarding any part that Scotland might have had in respect of possible UK involvement with rendition flights at Scottish airports. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government strongly opposes so-called rendition flights. Uh, Scotland has always been a country that respects the rights and responsibilities of all of its citizens and the rule of law. The Scottish Government has not and we will not approve a policy of facilitating the transfer of individuals through Scottish territory or airspace to places where there are substantial grounds to believe that they would face a real risk of torture. There is already an ongoing Police Scotland investigation directed by the Lord Advocate into the alleged use of Scottish airports for so-called rendition flights, and I hope everybody in the Chamber will agree that that must be allowed to run its course. Christine Graham. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for her answer? However, in 2005, following reports that inter alia there had been allegedly seven rendition flights by the CIA through Wick and Inverness airports, this led to the Danish government denying the use of their airspace to the CIA, yet the UK government and the then Scottish executive, which incidentally owned both airports, did nothing. It was treated, I repeat for the Tory press office, treated with similar, not with similar seriousness. Does she agree with me that there must be a fully independent judicial and not a UK Parliament inquiry and that the Crown Office, already referred to, plays its full part as it seems there may very well have been crimes committed on Scottish soil? First Minister. Well, I certainly agree with Christine Graham that these uh, issues raised by rendition flights should be fully and thoroughly investigated, not least where there has been any act of criminality. And I do support Christine Graham's call for the UK government to open an independent judge-led inquiry into these matters. As I indicated in my earlier answer, there's an ongoing criminal investigation into the alleged use of Scottish airports for rendition flights, and I am very sure that arrangements could be made to ensure a judge-led inquiry and the Police Scotland investigation can take place in parallel in order to ensure that these matters are scrutinised fully as they deserve to be. Question five, David Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the Ministry of Defence regarding the closure of the Kinloss Rescue Coordination Centre. First Minister. But let me start. The Government absolutely does not support the closure of the Aeronautical Rescue Coordination Centre at Kinloss. The relocation of the centre represents the latest in a series of disproportionate cuts to military personnel and MOD civilian staff in Scotland, and it also follows previous UK Government cuts to the Coast Guard Service, which this Government also strongly opposed. I'm disappointed to say that the Scottish Government was not alerted to and so held no discussions with the MOD in advance of their announcement. Uh, following that announcement, the Government contacted the MOD for urgent assurances that this will have no detrimental impact on search and rescue provision, tasking or coordination in Scotland. And subsequently, the <coughs> Infrastructure Secretary has written to the Secretary of State for Defence to confirm that the Scottish Government does not support this decision and to note our disappointment that we were neither consulted on or notified in advance of this announcement, despite the very significant devolved interest that are involved. Eva Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the First Minister for answer. Uh, at Christmas, a little more than 10 years ago, I was an observer on the RAF search and rescue helicopter, which was flying a few hundred feet over Loch Ness, sent by the centre to save a Swiss tourist who had fallen off the mountain at Glencoe. So I know firsthand the experience, the expertise and the excellence of the staff at King Loss. I, don't believe that I believe that closing the centre defies the military maxim that if it ain't broke, why fix it? Will the First Minister join with all the party leaders today to make an 11th hour bid to save the King Law Centre and provide some Christmas cheer for the civilian and military staff who were acknowledged by mountaineers and offshore workers alike as a beacon of light on the hill? First Minister. Well, can, I thank, can I thank Dave Stewart uh, for his question and the, the tone in which he asked it? I uh, can also acknowledge his long-standing interest and uh, his expertise in this area. Um, I couldn't agree more with the sentiments of his question or indeed the substance of his question. I would be delighted uh, to convene a cross-party uh, campaign uh, from this chamber to seek to persuade the UK government to change its mind and I'd be happy to have further discussions with Dave Stewart and his colleagues on that very matter. Question six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. May I associate the Green and Independent group of MSPs with the comments made regarding the terrible crimes in Pakistan and Australia and also offer our congratulations to Kez Dugdale on her election. And can I ask the First Minister what the Government's position is on the agreement reached at the climate change talks in Lima? First Minister. Uh, the Lima call for climate action has kept the international negotiations moving forward, although with very important issues, principally the overall level of global ambition yet to be resolved. Uh, Scotland has already unilaterally set challenging targets both pre and post 2020, with a world leading target of at least a 42% emissions cut by 2020, 58% by 2027, and that's in line with what the climate science tells us we have to do. Uh, Scotland's targets, of course, are not easy, but they are at the level the international community needs to match if the new Universal Climate Treaty in Paris next year is to stand a good chance of limiting global temperature rise to no more than two degrees Celsius, as the international community has already agreed to do. Patrick Harvey. If we're ever going to see a meaningful, robust and legally binding agreement come out of this process, it is vital that wealthy, developed countries, particularly those which are still precariously dependent on the production of the very fossil fuels which have brought the climate into such global peril, are able to make commitments of the kind the First Minister refers to. So the Scottish Government is right to attend these talks and to demonstrate that commitment. But that commitment is only credible if we start meeting the targets rather than just setting them. What policy changes does the First Minister think are necessary from the Scottish Government to start meeting those targets and rebuilding our credibility on climate change? First Minister. Oh. Firstly, I agree wholeheartedly with Patrick Harvey. There's no point setting targets if your determination is not to meet them. Uh, and we will continue through the RPP and further iterations uh, of that document to look very critically at the policy interventions we are making, uh, where we're not succeeding in some of those interventions, where we need to do more. And we will continue, as we have done in the past, to seek to involve the entire chamber in that. Just on one uh, positive uh, note, presiding officer, I think in the context of this question, it is worth noting that figures out uh, just this morning show that for the first time ever in Scotland, generation from renewables accounts for the same proportion of total generation as fossil fuels. So yes, there's much for us still to do, 
but we are making good progress and we do have the ambition to do more and I would hope that everybody would be able to welcome that progress. Lord Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the First Minister advise what assistance the Scottish Government can provide to developing countries to help them reduce emissions? First Minister. Well, we will uh, seek to make sure that everything we do through our international aid uh, programme, as well as the other objectives of that, helps uh, with reducing emissions. And uh, I know that uh, Hamza Yousaf, the External Affairs Minister, would be happy to uh, talk to Rod Campbell in, in greater detail. But perhaps the uh, greatest thing we can continue to do, not just in terms of developing countries, but overall, is to continue to challenge ourselves to lead by example, because actions in so many areas speak louder than words. So let's keep doing the right things, and in doing that, we can encourage others to follow our example. Sarah Boyd. What particular policy does the First Minister think we need to put on the agenda in Scotland, given that we have missed our targets three years in a row, and that there are key areas such as transport, housing and agriculture where we need to make urgent progress? First Minister. Well, Sarah Boyack, uh, and let me congratulate her on her new uh, Shadow Cabinet post. Um, Sarah Boyack knows what the specific policies we think we need to achieve are because they are laid out in some considerable detail in the RPP, right across the whole spectrum of our responsibilities on housing, yeah. on transport, on yeah. agriculture. Some of these are challenging and difficult to meet, which is why we need to continue to challenge ourselves to do more. If these targets were easy to meet, then they wouldn't be ambitious enough. So let's all uh, resolve to keep doing what we need to do. And there's a lesson here for all of us as politicians, because in my experience in government, which now stretches over seven years, what we get from the opposition is calls to do things until those things become controversial and then they oppose Absolutely. us doing these things. So let's all be determined not just to have warm words around this but be prepared to follow through with the brave action we need as well. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are moving to members' business. So members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.